agreed to lift their debt ceiling, but ominous clouds still remain on the world um, economic horizon with the European sovereign debt situation. How well placed is Australia to withstand um, a potential second financial shock on the scale of the GFC? We, we're not immune to the turbulence in the global economy. Uh, that's clear. And I think uh, the, one of the impacts of the global financial crisis has been that even though we dodged a bullet and we didn't see the high rising unemployment of other nations, including the Americans, uh, people did uh, see the impact. They saw it in their superannuation <coughs> returns. They saw it in uh, share market returns. And many Australians, mums and dads, uh, hold shares now. Uh, they also saw it in perceptions about their home loan equity or the equity they have in their home. Uh, we've lived for a long time with this Australian dream that if you buy a house then it's inevitable that the value just goes up and up and up and you get to realise that equity in your next purchase or for other purposes. I think uh, now people have realised that um, you know, the future might be one of more modest growth um, or in some parts of the country obviously people have thought perhaps uh, home prices, the value of their own home might have gone backwards. Uh, so these things have uh, pressed on, on people's thinking. Uh, but at the same time, we are living in a, a land of tremendous opportunity. Uh, we're in the right part of the world where growth is still occurring, where people have a voracious appetite for the things that we've got to sell, and that appetite will move beyond resources to other things as the Asian middle class grows, they too will want more choices about what they consume, about the services they use, about where they travel to, about how they educate themselves and their children. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for us and we come to this opportunity with great strength in the underlying fundamentals of our economy. Um, low unemployment, low public debt, a strong banking sector, good regulation, and all of the things that that brings. Uh, so I think Australians should, even as the world uh, sees the turbulence uh, that we've seen out of America and out of parts of Europe, Australians should have a sense of confidence and optimism about our economic future. You mentioned that we find ourselves in the right part of the world uh, in economic terms, and, and if there is unrest in, in Europe and North America, we're, we're at the edge of the turbulence. Um, if there were a major economic slowdown in China, we might be in the path of the storm. Do you think at this point we have the, the breadth in our economy across sectors and, and beyond minerals um, to withstand a slowdown in the Chinese economy? Uh, look, I'm, uh, uh, on, on prospects for uh, China, I believe we will continue to experience very strong demand. I mean, people, uh, obviously, commentators do look, and uh, there's a very lively debate in our newspapers and beyond about China's growth rates. Uh, but uh, the kind of commentary we're seeing about uh, some potentials for slowing of growth is still a lot of growth. You know, we're talking about uh, uh, adjustments at the top, still a lot of growth. Uh, and in circumstances where China's growth already uh, is uh, demanding effectively everything that we can sell, I mean, their demand is beyond, uh, you know, our capacity to supply. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think you know, we can look forward to a great deal of continuing strength in demand for resources and a great deal of strength in commodity prices. Uh, but uh, as we see in our economy now, uh, that does mean that there are a, a patchwork of effects and pressures. Sustained high Australian dollar is good for some and bad for others. Uh, the voracious demand of resources for skills and for uh, investment uh, and infrastructure uh, means that you know money runs and people run uh, to the growth industry and that creates challenges for other parts of the economy. Uh, I do think that that requires us to be uh, more finely calibrated in our thinking about place, mm -hmm. about regions and about individual industries than it's been traditional for a federal government to be where uh, you know, the job has been viewed as getting the big macroeconomic indicators right and the rest sort of sorts itself out. Uh, we do need to get the big macroeconomic indicators right, but we also do need to inform government policy with this sense of place and industry. Uh, and you'll see more of uh, that coming from the government over time. Uh, I think we've already got that uh, feeding in through some economic development work that's happening in regions 
and some good, not old-fashioned, cumbersome industry policy interventions, but some good partnership with industry around innovation. Uh, and we need to keep working on that as we see these patchworks in our economy. It's no secret that some of your big reform proposals are contentious and that the debate around them really? is heated <laughs> and, and, and you know, sometimes heavy on rhetoric and light on facts. And I'd like to um, quote back to you something you said towards the end of the last year about um, the public debate and, and the media more broadly. You said, um, when I stand up to do a press conference, someone's tweeting at the back of the room. Uh, while I'm doing the press conference, someone's using me as a backdrop in a stand-up <laughs> interview. Um, on the way back from the press conference, one journalist is interviewing another about what that may or may not have meant. And then two hours later, you get a call, your press secretary gets a call saying, oh, what was the story again? Yeah. Um, can I ask you, <laughs> how hard is it to advance complex policy reforms and policy proposals in that environment? Look, I think... I think it's always been hard to advance complex policy reforms. I think we, uh, uh, we live with this grand mm. nostalgia about uh, the, the political past and there's sometimes this uh, sense in the contemporary uh, dialogue that, you know, in the political past, uh, Prime Ministers got up and said, well, we're definitely going to do this and everybody went, sure, OK, and got about doing it. Uh, well, you know, I can remember a fair bit of Australian contemporary political history. I can certainly remember very clearly the days of the Hawke and Keating governments. And that's not my recollection of the big changes, let me tell you. It's not my recollection uh, of the tariff debate that had uh, the ALP up in flames uh, and traditional Labor constituencies in this country in revolt uh, because they were exactly the people who worked in the industries under pressure textile, clothing, footwear, car manufacturing. Uh, I remember all of that. Uh, I remember the uh, reactions to the Keating engagement with Asia, and indeed we saw some of those reactions play out in our contemporary uh, politics of that day, and not happily, as people would recall. So sustaining big reform drives has always been hard. I think it's uh, particularly uh, there, there are some new particular factors which might make it uh, a bit harder than it's been in the past. Uh, there's the 24-7 uh, restlessness of the political conversation. So it's uh, harder to sustain a deep conversation. And then at the same time, there's a fracturing about where people get their information sources. Uh, so, you know, to, to take an example, in the days of tariff reform, uh, people would have seen the Prime Minister and the Treasurer talk about that on the 6 o'clock news and they could have sat there and one person in the household said, it's a good thing, that's going to change our economy and modernise it, and one person in the household say, that's a diabolically bad thing because it means Aunt Susie will lose her job, um, and the debate would happen. Uh, now, because people get their information from so many places, it is possible for people to lock on to... Uh, streams of information which just consistently serve them up the wrong stuff, um, which is why it is possible in America, So, you know, years after President Obama was elected, for there are Americans to believe that he wasn't born, born in America because they consistently get their facts uh, from a place that tells them that he's not American and so it becomes reinforcing uh, and it's harder to get um, actual <coughs> facts into the conversation. I think we see some evidence of that uh, in some of our big national debates, including particularly the climate change debate. Yeah. Politicians of all stripes will tell us that to prosper in the 21st century world, Australia must be a successful knowledge economy. Um, yet for a long time, over the last 15 years or so, um, public spending on, on universities and R&D had fallen as a share of GDP. Now, your government's turned that around somewhat in the last couple of budgets, but how much more work do we have to do there? Uh, we've got continuing work to do, but I'm uh, very uh, pleased with not only the impacts of new resources, but of a profound reform agenda. Uh, I think uh, actually the depth of the university reform agenda that we have put in place uh, hasn't been appreciated yet. Uh, and I'm not surprised by that because you put it in place and universities start adjusting and it takes a while for people to see the impacts. Uh, but we've put universities, universities fundamentally on a path to growth. Uh, we've created a demand-driven system. So uh, it's not a question of a capped pool of places and kids lucky enough to get a place out of the cap. 
uh, places will follow student demand on a path to growth. And I am 